chapter 20, and let's start reading with verse 1. Uh, tonight I'm going to preach my last message on a series of messages on prophecy, and uh, this will be the last one. Tonight I'm going to be preaching on, uh, in prophecy, the millennium, and that's the year, that's the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ on this earth. And then tonight I'm going to go also into eternity and finish up the last series of messages. Revelation chapter 20 verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him unto the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they set upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, nor his image, nor had received his mark upon their forehead or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. In such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ. And shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired. Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog. To gather them together to battle for the number of who is as the sands of seas. And they went up on the breadths of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire come down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, tonight I pray you just wash my mind in the blood of Jesus Christ. I pray that you would wash me and cleanse me and make me whole. And Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ upon this message tonight. I pray that I would say nothing more than you want me to say, Father. I pray that you'd say me nothing less than you want me to say. And yet, Father, I pray that your people would be fed with the, not only the milk of the word, but also the meat of the word this evening. And may it be encouraging and understanding and give light and give life, Father. In Jesus' precious name I pray, and for his sake, amen. Now tonight I want to preach on two things. I want to preach on the millennium, and I want to preach on uh, eternity also. Now let's uh, get a beginning place, and let's start in the book of Math, uh, Revelation chapter 20. And I'm going to give you some of the things as they, they happen during the tribulation. All right. Uh, Revelation chapter 20 now. The front of the first thing that's happened. You can put this on the calendar. Or put this on a chart or a piece of paper. Number one. The devil is cast into the bottomless pit. That's the first thing that happens at the beginning of the millennium. Now notice that in scripture. Revelation chapter 20 verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, have the keys of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of that on the dragon, that old serpent which is the devil, and Satan, and bound, B-O-U-N-D, bound him a thousand years. So the first and one of the great things about the tribulation, the, the millennium period, the 1,000 year reign of Christ on this earth, is the fact that the devil is not a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. 
And the devil is not deceiving anybody in that great period of time. The devil is chained up on a chain in the bottomless pit. Now you know that's a great thing to know and that's absolutely important to know. You know why it's absolutely important to know? Is because there's no possible way that we could now be in the millennium. Because the devil is walking around deceiving the, deceiving the whole world before him tonight. I mean, this world is in a hellish mess. The devil is running rampant and deceiving everybody. And yet, some idiot will say, you're welcome, <laughs> that we are in the millennium now and Christ is reigning. They are post-millennial in their theology. Now, that can't possibly be. Alright, the devil is chained up. And he's during, chained up during that 1,000 year reign. Then yet at the end of the millennium, this is future now, this is some future period of 1,000 years up in the future. It hadn't occurred as, as today. It's still future. But at the end of that millennium, there is a great battle that takes place called the Battle of Gog and Magog. Notice it now in Revelation chapter 20. And skip down to verse 7. Skip down to verse 7 in Revelation 20. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. That's at the end of the millennium. And shall go out to deceive. He deceives somebody. The nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to deceive them that together to the battle to gather them together to the battle, for the number of whom is as the sands of the seas. So at the end of the millennium period, the devil is lo let loose for a short period of time, and it goes out and deceives some people. So during that millennial reign, you know what makes people go bad and sin during the millennium? Their human nature that comes from Adam. They still have a human fallen nature and they're still sinful. They don't sin because the devil tempts them. They sin because they are sinners by nature on the inside. They got the nature of Adam. Therefore they still sin because of their own fallen nature. And therefore they take place and they go in to the battle of Gog and Magog and turn against God Almighty and rebel against Him at the end of that millennial period of time. Alright, now here's another verse. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Matthew. Turn to Matthew. Turn to Matthew chapter 25. Here's one of the next things that occur in the uh, millennium. This is one of the next accounts that occur. Uh, Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. And let's pick up verse 31. And the next thing, after the devil is bound in the bottomless pit and chained up with a great chain, we find in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31. When, giving you the time element, when the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him. So when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back from heaven, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. The throne of his glory. So the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back. The devil is going to be chained up in the bottomless pit and put in a chain. And then the Lord Jesus Christ is going to sit upon the throne of His glory. Now let's see where the throne of His glory is at. Take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke. Now you want to write some of these passages down this evening because they are great, plain, and clear passages on the great millennial period of the Lord Jesus Christ when He comes back to this earth to reign upon this earth. Luke chapter 1 verse 30. Luke chapter 1 verse 30 says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, 
and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. The throne of his father David. Then that's the throne that is in Jerusalem. Then that's the literal, visible, physical throne on this earth in a millennial reign, which is the throne of David on this earth in the land of Palestine, in Jerusalem, in that city, on that throne. And back to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. That is the throne of His glory. Now, uh, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 32 now. The throne of His glory, which is the throne of His father David, which is in Jerusalem, in the land of Palestine. Matthew chapter 25 verse 32. And before Him shall be gathered all nations. All nations. Here is the judgment of nations that takes place right after Christ's return to this earth and right after the devil is chained up in the bottomless pit. Then the Lord gathers the nations around about Him and He has the judgment of nations. This occurs at the beginning of the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice this judgment of nations. All right, judgment of nations here. Uh, verse 32, And he shall separate them one from another, as the shepherd divide the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, uh, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king, the king is Jesus Christ. He's the king. He's reigning. He's in the millennium. Then shall the king, Jesus Christ, say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom. The kingdom there is the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was in sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall a righteous, that's the sheep, that's the sheep nations back up there, answered him saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, and naked and clothed thee? Now watch it. Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison and came unto thee? Verse 40, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Insomuch, as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren. Now in the passage it talks about my brethren. Then the my brethren is not the sheep. My brethren is not the goats. My brethren is not the king. My brethren is the Jews. Then he's talking about how did you treat the Jews in the great tribulation period. Because the people that are being judged here are those people that come through the great tribulation period. Because the Christians have already been judged at the judgment seat of Christ. This is not the judgment of unsaved people because they will come at the great white throne judgment. This is not the judgment of a Christian because the Christian is judged at the judgment seat of Christ which is already passed at this time. So this is the judgment of those folks that went through the great tribulation period and how they treated the Jewish people during the great tribulation. Now again, Matthew 25, verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, unto everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was a hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me. Nor sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall I also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we then hungered, and thirsty, and stranger, or naked, or sick, or in a prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall I answer them, and say, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as you did it not, 
unto one of the least of these, that's his brethren, back there that he said in verse 40, ye did it not unto me, and these shall go away unto everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. Now you take that passage right there, and you pervert that passage and put that passage on a Christian. Now you know what you'd teach if you put it on a Christian? If you're good and you go out and you help everybody out and you help the Salvation Army and you go visit everybody and you give them this and you give them that and you help everybody out in the country and you live a good life, then your good works are outweigh your bad works and you go to heaven. See how they get it? See where they get it from the Scripture? See the verses they would take to prove to you you got to work to get to heaven? How many of you see that? See that thing? Boy, if you don't see that, brother, you saw something. If you saw that. What have they done? They've taken a passage that was aimed at a man in the great tribulation who was overcoming the mark of the beast, who was helping out the Jews, who was uh, getting saved by the blood of the Lamb and living it, brother. Somebody says, this doctrine that you got to endure and overcome, that's a tribulation doctrine. I hope that you can see by reading and understanding the passage here this evening, this is the judgment of nations of those that come out of the great tribulation. This is not a judgment for Christians. This is not, you know how you can find if you got a perverted Bible? If you got a Bible that says a general judgment in the margin. Now look in the margin of your Bible. If you have in the margin of your Bible here that says general judgment. You got a Bible that is post-millennial. It's not a pre-millennial Bible if it says a general judgment. This is not the general judgment. This is the judgment of nations at the beginning of the millennium. And you must get that straight. All right, again, take your Bible this evening and turn to Revelation chapter 11. Now let's get into some things, not Revelation 11, but Isaiah 11. And let's find some things that occur during the millennial period. Isaiah chapter 11. Here's just one of the things that will occur. We talked about the devil being chained up. We talked about the judgment of nations occurring. Now we're going to talk about some of the things that will go through that 1,000 period, year period of time. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 6. Isaiah 11 6 says, and the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Now this is the thing that happens before Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve was back in the Garden of Eden, all the animals were vegetarian. They ate straw, they ate uh, leaves, they ate grass. The lion would eat, not eat uh, meat. A lion would not eat a lamb. A lion would not eat those kind of things. He was a vegetarian. That's all he would eat was grass. When Adam fell and sinned and was kicked out of the Garden and the curse come on the earth, then the animals would eat each other. Now let me ask you something. You believe that verse? How many of you believe that verse? Now if you don't believe it, you know what you've got to do with the thing? You've got to throw it out or you've got to make it symbolical and figurative. Now if you're a post millennialist and you believe that Jesus Christ is reigning now and we're in the kingdom now, you come along that chain and you say, Ah, oh, the wolf is a terrible boogie, boogie, boogie. But the spiritual application of the passage would be and give you some crazy thing that doesn't make a bit of sense to you. And he gives you a private, personal interpretation and he gives you a symbolical meaning and a figurative meaning to the Word of God. That lion will eat your life today if you get in the cage with him. Brother, the Bible says a lion and the ox shall lie down together and a little child shall eat them. Little child shall eat them. I read in the paper somebody, I don't remember where it was at, but somebody, uh, a wolf, 
a fella had a wolf and had his wolf in his backyard tied up and a little kid came across the neighbor and this wolf liked to eat that little boy. A wolf just happened here or just a month or so ago in the paper. And you know what that is? We ain't in the millennium. We ain't in the millennium. I'd again turn to Amos chapter 9. Amos chapter 9. Here's another thing that occurs during the millennial period of time. Amos and Amos chapter uh, 9 verse 12. Hosea, Joel, Amos. Amos chapter 9 and verse 12. Amos 9, 12. All right. All right. They, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the heathen which are called by thy name, saith the Lord that dwelleth this. Behold, the days cometh, saith the Lord. This is a millennial passage now. That the plowman, underline it, the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. And the mountain shall drop sweet wine and all the hills shall melt. Now notice it says, the plowman shall overtake the reaper. Now the plowman is the guy that gets the plow and he starts plowing the field. He plowing the field and he got his tractor and he's calling his, his poor plow, bottom plows behind it and he's going down the field, turning over the soil. He's the plowman. And the other fellow is the fellow that got the columbine. He's got the columbine, he's up there going down the field with a columbine. And he going down the field with a columbine. Here comes the plowman. He said, slow down, fellow. You're too far ahead of me. I ain't even got the crop reaped yet. That guy's plowing it up. You say, what's it doing? That's year-round crops, brother. That's year-round crop. I get through planting a garden and plant another garden. Plant the garden, plant another garden. Plant a garden, plant another garden. Why? Because the earth has been regenerated. And the curse has been taken off the earth. Back down into the garden of Eden again. Why? That's what God wants. God's going to take that old curse and take it off this earth. Take it thing off. All right, again, take your Bibles and uh, let's take and get some other verses. Uh, turn to Isaiah chapter uh, 12 now. Now remember, in the millennial period, of, in the millennium period, Jesus Christ is where at? Where is Jesus Christ happening right now? Where's Jesus Christ at? How many say he's up in heaven? How many say he's in your heart? He's both places, isn't he? He's both places, amen? He's both places. All right, where is his body at? The Son of Man sitting at what place? Right hand of the throne of God. When he comes down to this earth, sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem, where is he then? He's in front of their eyeballs. Looking right at him. Looking right at him and beholding him. And literally worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he is right there. Right now, today, you know what I say to you? I say, have faith. Believe, have faith. You can't see him. You can't feel him. You can't touch him. Have faith in Jesus Christ. Believe. But in the millennium, it's no longer going to be that. Because you will not have to say, have faith. You don't have to have faith in something you can see, brother. You have in faith in something you cannot see. That's faith. In the millennium, it is a matter of fear works. It is no longer a thing of have faith in Jesus Christ, accept Him as your personal Savior and trust in His blood. No longer that. It's obey or else. Jesus Christ will be ruling with what? A what's He ruling with? A rod of iron. You know what that is? That's law, brother. A rod of iron. Why Christ is ruling in that way. I'm going to take you past your Bible now and let me show you some verses. Turn to, uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8.
Now I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you from the scriptures what I just said to you this evening. Just now I'm going to show you from the word of God about that great millennial period of time. Hebrews chapter 8 and let's pick up verse 8 now. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 8. And finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the day cometh, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Now who is the finding fault with them? The them is the house of Israel. Who's the house of Israel? The Jews. All right. Notice he said he'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the Jews, and with the house of Ju uh, Judah, the Jews. Uh, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. Who's their fathers? That their fathers is the Jews. And in a day when I took them, the Jews, by the hand and led them, the Jews, out of the land of Egypt. Now, you know what most Christians will say about this passage? You know what 90% of the preachers today will tell you about this passage? They'll say, that passage is the Christians, and the Christians get a new covenant with the Lord. That is 100% wrong. He's not talking to the Christians in this day and age. He's talking to Israel. The Jews is getting a new covenant. Not the church. Not the same, not the born again of this period of time, but the Jews one of these days will get a new covenant with the Lord. Now again, uh, I will take them by the hand and lead them out of the land of Egypt because they, the Jews, continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For thus is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. That's not the Christians. That's not the church. That's not you and me. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their mind, and I write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Now that is not aimed at the Christian. That is aimed at the Jews over in the millennial period of time. Because God makes a new covenant with them. And God becomes their God. Now look at the next verse. This is the one I want you to see. And they. Who's the they? The they is the with them. The them, the them, and the they, and the them. Back there at 8, 9, and 10. And verse 10. Uh, the house of Israel, the house of Judah, the house of Israel. That's who it is. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord? What do you mean they shall not say that? I say it every day. I say you need to know the Lord as your personal Savior. You need to come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I preach it. I spend my whole lifetime doing it. And it said yet, And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every... Man his brother saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. That's not today. Do all know him from the least to the greatest? That's a millennial doctrine. That's a passage that goes into the great millennial period of time where there no longer be the prophets of God standing up and prophesying before the Lord. In the millennial period of time, if a man prophesies, he gets his head cut off. You are a prophet of God now, today. A prophet's heard past. In the millennial period, it's all over for prophecy. All right, take your Bible and turn to another passage. Turn to uh, uh, Zechariah chapter 13 in the Old Testament. Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah chapter 13. And let's pick up verse 1. I'll give you a minute to get there. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1. Zechariah 13, 1. In that day, that's the day of the millennial. In that day, there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, 
that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And I also will cause the prophet and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land, and it shall come to pass, now watch it, when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother that begot him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother that begot him shall thrust him through when he prophesies. Then in the great millennial period of time, when a man prophesies in that period of time, he prophesies all over, and he is to die for prophesying. Why? Because you're looking at Jesus Christ eyeball to eyeball, face to face, person right straight across the line, brother. There's no faith then, brother. It's no believe and have faith. Then you pure works. In the, in the millennial period of time, you go to the book of Matthew, and you see the Sermon on the Mount, and it says, pluck out thy eye and cut off thy hand. That's a millennial doctrine. In the millennium, it's a literal, visible, physical kingdom, and everything is pure works. You take those verses and put them back on a Christian and put them in this day and age, and you get a Christian cutting off his hand and plucking out his eye. So what do you got to do? You got to give it a spiritual application. But what is the real, visible, absolute verse, and what does it say? It said, whack it off, brother. Whack it off. In the millennium, it's better to whack that arm off and pluck out that eye than being taken and cast alive into that bleed that's over there in Isaiah chapter 66. All right? Again, let's uh, go on. Uh, what does a Christian have to do with the millennium? What is going to be your part in the millennial reign of Christ? I want to preach on that for a moment. First of all, when the rapture comes and every Christian is raptured off this earth and taken up to heaven, God gives you a brand new body. Gives you a new body. Brand one, new one. One that won't sin, one that won't die, one that won't be tempted, one that has all power. And that body can never die anymore. That body can never sin anymore. That body can never be tempted anymore. After rapture, that is given to you. Then you go through the judgment seat of Christ. You come back and you come back with Jesus Christ to this earth. At the battle of Armageddon. But your part is found here. Take your Bible and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now if you're here this evening, you take heed. Because this will be your part in the great millennium. Alright. 2 Peter chapter 2. And verse 12, 2 Peter 2, 12. Now take heed to God's holy word. Now if you don't believe the Bible, and you don't believe what you hear, you don't get what I'm preaching about you this evening. It'll pass right over you and pass right by you. Uh, 2 Timothy 2. Did I say 2 Peter? 2 Timothy. Sorry about that, brother. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. I'm going too fast. I got to slow down. I'm just going 100 miles an hour, and going this fast, you just you miss you miss one verse somewhere. Second Timothy chapter two and verse 12. Second Timothy 2:12. All right. If that's the qualification uh, statement, if you don't have to, you can if you do. You you can if you can. You don't have to do it. You don't have to suffer. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now that's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and you suffering for Jesus Christ now in this life as a child of God. If you suffer for Jesus Christ you will reign with him over in the millennial reign of Christ when he comes back and reigns on the earth. You will reign with him on the earth if you suffer for Jesus Christ now. If you don't suffer for Jesus Christ now, you will not reign. No reign, no suffering. No suffering, no reign. If, that's the qualification. Now you say, Brother Bemis, what does suffering include? 
suffering for Jesus Christ uh, conclude an awful lot of things. Uh, taking ridicule for Jesus Christ. Being laughed at. Doing without. Many things can be suffered for Jesus Christ. I'm certain we don't suffer of enough. Amen? I'm certain we could suffer a lot more than we do. You know what you ought to pray? You ought to pray, Lord Jesus, let me suffer for you. Now, come on now. Did you just read what I just showed you? Do you believe what I just showed you? How many of you believe it? How many of you are going to claim it? That's another question, preacher. <laughs> You know what you ought to pray? You ought to go home. You ought to get out on your hands and knees and say, Lord, let me suffer for you. But then that suffering is going to hurt. Going to hurt. But if you suffer, you reign. If you don't suffer, you don't reign. That's just that simple. Look at the next verse. Now the next verse was given in case some poor a uh, weak Christian should interpret the first verse, verse 12, deny him and thinking that Jesus Christ would deny you salvation. So the Apostle Paul immediately, right after that, explained what he was talking about because he knew that you would twist the verse and say, ha ha, see there, you can lose your salvation because you haven't got the assurance that you should have. So he writes this, if we save people, including himself, if we believe not, stop believing, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. A lot of Christians say you get saved by believing. What must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth. You get saved by believing. So they said you get saved by believing, you get lost by disbelieving. How many of you ever heard that one? Sure. What does the verse say? The verse says, If we believe not, if you stop believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and say, I don't believe anymore, you'd still be saved. You'd still be saved. You'd still be God's child. Why? Because He cannot deny Himself. You're bone of His bone and flesh of His flesh. You're part of the body of Jesus Christ. That's why you can't lose your salvation, brother. That's the eternal security of the believer. That's one saved, always saved. That's what that is. You can lose the assurance of your salvation. You can lose the joy of your salvation. You can lose your rewards in heaven. You can not suffer with Jesus Christ. You can lose your life. You can lose a lot of things, but brother, you can't lose your soul's salvation. I right, again, take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 19. And then I'll go on into eternity. <laughs> Luke chapter 19. And of course, I haven't by any way, shape, or form given you the things that occur in the millennium. There's about thousands and thousands and thousands of verses on the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. If I preached on just the millennium, I could preach without a doubt at least a solid month, eight hours a day, preaching on the millennium. There's no doubt in my mind about it. Verse after verse after verse after verse, hundreds of verses on the millennial reign of Christ. But Luke chapter 19, and let me finish up the Christian's part in the millennium. Luke chapter 19, <clears throat> and look at verse 17 Luke 19 17 now this is on the earth is where this occurs it occurs on the earth during the millennium for those who suffer with Jesus Christ verse 17 and he saith unto him well thy good servant because thou has been faithful in a very little have thou authority over ten cities and the second came, saying, Thy pound hath gained five pounds. The pound is your talent. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. Then when a Christian lives for the Lord Jesus Christ and suffers for him and uses his talent for the Lord and does not what, folks? He that is what? Say it again. Say it again. 
faithful, brother. You know what God wants out of you? He wants faithfulness. I mean faithful day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. Stand by the Lord till the day you go home to heaven, brother. And don't you quit and don't you cry and bawl and complain and bellyache about it. You serve God with a joyful heart and a joyful mind and God will give you the reward. He said faithful in a very little. That's a little thing. He didn't say faithful in a big job. He didn't say faithful in a great big old ministry we have here, this big old plant we have. He said faithful in a little. Amen? Then you've got three kids in your Sunday school class. You work at it like you had 900 kids in your Sunday school class. Brother, you come in and you're just as prepared as though uh, those kids' soul salvation was dependent upon you. It is, by the way. <laughs> Amen? I am absolutely certain the reason why I accepted Jesus Christ is because I had a good Sunday school teacher. If you could analyze the whole thing out, brother, if you analyzed it back to why I got saved, I had a Sunday school teacher that taught me and taught me and taught me and taught me and taught me. And when the Holy Spirit said, Nathan, you're lost, I said, you betcha I am. <laughs> and I wasn't so dumb and ignorant about it. I knew what it was to be born again because I had a faithful teacher. I'd again, let's go into eternity now. Eternity. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation. Turn to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Into the millennium. The millennium is over right there. Verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. The devil that deceived those folks at the end of the millennium was thrown into the lake of fire. And brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. They got thrown in there at the end of the tribulation. So they've been in there a thousand years and then the devil is thrown in there with them. That's the satanic trinity there in verse 10. And shall be tormented day and night. There's day and night in hell. Forever and ever. Hell lasts forever. It ain't just annihilation. It is a hell, fire, and damnation, damnation for an eternal lake of fire. Verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. This is the last judgment. This is the judgment of the unsaved. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. Now that you have to find the earth and the heavens fled away. You have to go back to Second Peter and find in the earth exploding with a ball of fire and going up and being renovated with a flame and a baptism of fire upon this earth. Now turn to Second Peter. Turn to 2 Peter chapter uh, uh, 3 and look at verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief of the night, in which the heavens, plural, shall melt away with a great noise, and the elements, Greek word for Adam, elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are in shall be burned up. So God comes along and after the millennium's over, He takes this earth and it goes up in a ball of fire and the heavens go and melt away with a great noise. And that for earth fire comes around and it just involves this earth in a ball of flame. Alright? And then the great white throne judgment occurs. Uh, verse 12, verse 13, verse 14, and verse 15. That's the last judgment of all the unsaved at the last and final judgment of every unsaved man on this earth. Then Revelation 21 verse 1. And I saw a new heaven. God makes a new one. A new heaven. That's number one. And a new earth. That's number two. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city New Jerusalem. So you have three things there. You have a new earth, you have a new heaven, and you have new Jerusalem. Three new places that occur in eternity. Now remember, the uh, millennium's over, the great white throne judgment is over, and eternity begins. You have those three major places. 
Now, the reason why you have those three major places is because of this verse found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 shows you why there's the three major places of the new heavens, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32 says, Give no offense neither to the Jew, nor to the Gentile, nor to the church of God. The Jews inherit the new earth in eternity. And there's about uh, 40 or 50 verses to show you that. And the that's the no offense to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, they inherit the new heavens. Or to the church of God. And the church of God inherits the new Jerusalem. Alright, uh, for a few verses now, in eternity. Alright, take your Bible and turn to Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah 66. And this is in eternity now. This is when time is no more and the clock has been stopped and the time is itself is completely stopped and you're in an everlasting eternal state. Isaiah chapter 66 and let's pick up verse 22. Now notice the context like Ruck, Dr. Ruckman always says a text without a context is a pretext and so you have to get the context of every verse in the Bible. Uh, Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 22. Now watch it. For as the new heavens, where are you at? Where are you at? Where's your location? Eternity. As the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord. So, now watch it, so shall your seed and your name remain. Now you know what that seed is? That seed is the people that come through the tribulation who have physical bodies. Those people in the millennium that have children that have physical bodies like Adam and Eve had. In eternity, there will be those people like you and me who have a spiritual body that like Christ had when He come up out of the grave that has a no uh, physical aspect to it outside of it has bones and it has flesh but that body is so spiritual it can pass through a solid object without the solid object moving but these folks in here in eternity that are on the earth will have a physical body like Adam and Eve had before they fell and they will be able to have children and have a seed that passes on a physical people with a physical body, yet without the sin nature of Adam and Eve, but have the nature that Adam and Eve had before they fell. Now let's look at it again. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 23 this time. Now you can't get this unless you believe the Word of God. If you're not a Bible believer, you won't get what I'm saying, do you now? You have got to be a Bible believer to get this. All right, not just those that profess to believe the Bible. It shall come to pass that from one new moon to another. This is outside the New Jerusalem now. And from one Sabbath to another. That's in eternity. And all flesh, those with physical bodies, shall come and worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth. And look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed. Those that transgressed in the millennium and those that transgressed in the tribulation. Against me. Will it be for any age, really? For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall abhor of all flesh. You know what it says? Abhor of all flesh? That's those folks that are on the earth in an eternal state of the Jews that inherit the earth. You say, Brother Bemis, show me that again. Turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. In Isaiah chapter 9, look at verse 7. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7. For the increase of His government... 
This is talking about Jesus Christ. Anybody that knows any prophecy knows that the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 is direct prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. No doubt about it. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 is the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Well, let's read it. Verse 6. For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, the Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of, of Peace. That's Jesus Christ. Now watch it. Verse 7. And the increase, underline that, increase. That's the physical increase of His kingdom. It increases and increases and increases and increases. It just goes and goes and goes and goes. Physical increase, not spiritual increase. Of His what? Government. That's the government on this earth in the throne of David. It just increases, 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 increases and increases. And the peace... There shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice and from henceforth even forever. Then the physical increase of the Lord's millennial kingdom when the millennium goes on and the fire is renovated and there's that new earth that thing just goes and goes and goes and people multiply and multiply and multiply and multiply and multiply and multiply. multiply, multiply, Just like He told Adam and Eve to do. Multiply and multiply and multiply and multiply and multiply and multiply. I again take your Bibles and turn over to uh, uh, Isaiah and turn this time to Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah 65, and then we'll have a few questions. We'll let you all ask a few questions tonight. This is not a normal situation, so I'll just let you ask a few questions. (laughs) Isaiah chapter uh, 65, and this will be the last verse, and then I'll have you ask some questions. Isaiah 65, and let's pick up verse 7. Now, what I want to show you here this evening while with this verse is that you will eventually... Come to the place where God Almighty will let you forget all of your troubles of this life. When you go up to the judgment seat of Christ, you'll remember where you messed up down here. When you come into reign in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, you will uh, have to suffer for not living the right kind of Christian life. But there'll finally come a day when the Lord will come to you and say, All right, my son... I'll let you just forget that whole thing back there in the past, and I'll just let you forget the whole thing final and last and complete, and I'll finally be saved. Whew. Praise the Lord. I don't have to worry about that no more. And brother, here's the verse. Now let me give it to you. Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 16. 65, 16. Because I don't care who you are, you're going to mess up enough times to say, I just wish, I'm so sick and tired of this thing, I just wish I was in heaven. Amen? And you get enough times where you just say, I'm so sick and tired of myself, I wish I was in heaven. Amen? Don't you just think that you're a wicked sinner sometimes? Come on now, don't you? Or do you think you're so saintly that you just don't sin? The Bible says, He that says he has no sin deceives himself, and the truth is not in him. Brother, the closer you get to God, the more sin you're going to see that you've got. He is holy, and He is sinful, and He's without any sin. And the closer you get to Him, the worse you're going to look. Brother, you're going to, you're going to start picking up some things and picking up some things you say, Oh, boy, I didn't know that was a sin. Oh, that thing's wicked. Me, boy. Oh, that thing's rough. And you're going to change your opinion to yourself. And the further away from you are, you're going to say, well, nothing wrong with me. Oh, I don't have anything wrong. What's wrong? I, I looked all day long. Couldn't find any mistakes. <laughs> you say, oh, Brother, people, brother Bemis, they don't get it that way. You don't know Christians like I know Christians. They get just that away. Because they're too busy looking at somebody else. Pick, 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 pick. 
And instead of pointing the finger at themselves, you know what you ought to do? You ought to go like this. Amen, brother. You ought to just go like this every once in a while. And then you ain't get a better look on yourself. I just give you that. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 65. Now let's get it. Verse 17. For behold, I create new heaven. Where you're at? A text without context, like Dr. Ruckman says. A text without a context is a pretext. For behold, I create new heavens and new earth. You're over there in eternity now. And the former, that's way back millennium, tribulation, church age, shall not be remembered nor come unto mind. Go back and pick up verse 16. That he who blessed himself in the earth shall be bless himself in the God of truth, and he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth. Now watch it. Because the former, now I'm reading verse 16, because the former troubles are forgotten, and because they are hid from mine's eyes. Woo! Oh, that's good. You say, why is that so good? Because of the simple fact, brother, I don't care how hard you try or how hard you work at it, there's still some inside of you that says, I'm rotten and no good. Amen? You bet. All right. Questions. We hit eternity and we just got started. <laughs> but so I don't want to run out of time. I want to give you a few minutes for some questions now. Y'all have some questions? Just raise your hand. Question. 